I now want to at least uh, amplify on some of the uh, possible repercussions for uh, the justices of Nigeria and otherwise if the decision of January 14th uh, flagrantly fraudulent uh, issued in bad faith uh, to deny a fundamental internationally recognized human right to self-government to uh, participate in elections that are freely and fairly conducted. We have in the United States a uh, recent law called the Global Magnitsky Human Rights Accountability Act. Uh, and it does empower the president at the request of the Secretary of State and various committee chairmen in the Congress to list persons abroad uh, to be denied visas, to have their assets frozen, to be excluded from commerce in the United States if they are complicit in internationally recognized human rights violations. And judges and justices are not shielded from that particular law. So that certainly would be a risk in my judgment uh, to the Nigerian Supreme Court uh, if this decision flagrantly tainted uh, is not reversed. And it could impact not only the seven justices who sat on the particular case, but the entire contingent of the Supreme Court, the whole institution has shown it is corrupted and compromised. Uh, we would encourage perhaps the others who weren't sitting uh, to remind the sitting justices that uh, there are others who would be uh, impacted uh, if they stood on their earlier fraudulent decision. Uh, it's also possible that uh, you could have ordered uh, an international investigation uh, under the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. Uh, it's arguable that wholesale deprivation of the right to self-determination, the right of self-government uh, that has been witnessed by this decision uh, is a crime against humanity. Uh, it violates Article 21 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights violates Article 25 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and certainly that's something that should be in the minds, we believe, of those justices. It's not a threat, it's simply an encouragement, an incentive uh, to do the right thing. Uh, the, we want this to be win-win. Uh, it would restore some luster to the Nigerian Supreme Court, uh, to uh, paraphrase Alexander Pope's uh, essay on man, error is human, but to confess error is divine, right? <laughs> uh, so at least those are the, the spectrum, I think, of possible uh, actions in the United States. There may well be congressional hearings uh, from the House and Senate Foreign Affairs Subcommittees on Africa to examine what's going on. Uh, they, members of Congress, have an interest in ensuring that the substantial military and economic aid that we're providing to Nigeria uh, is being used by a country that respects the rights of its own citizens under its own constitution. Uh, and that's something that in the past our Congress has been quite willing uh, to exercise uh, oversight of the appropriations it's providing to foreign countries. That's the kind of the spectrum that we have, but there's also an importance, I believe, and why the media is important, that the more that is written about this, the more that uh, this is, uh, rises to the surface of a very, very critical problem uh, confronting the, the most populous country in all of Africa, uh, whose instability could uh, have ripple effects uh, throughout the continent, not just West Africa, uh, would be very, very, uh, uh, constructive in influencing the Nigerian Supreme Court. Uh, and I also think, however, as I explained earlier, uh, this Supreme Court did not do this on its own. Uh, no judges would expose themselves to such ridicule unless there was some other force uh, that was compromising their independence. And that means uh, a hard look needs to be taken at the APC leadership as well. I don't know if you would like to also expand on what you think other possible remedies 
uh, could be, and then we can entertain questions from the audience. I just want to amplify that uh, we believe that there's a possibility that the international community can be brought to bear, the UN, uh, from the Declaration of Human Rights all the way through. This is a very, very serious matter. There's something that I didn't mention and I hesitate to mention because I am not Nigerian, although I think uh, Dr. Lloyd has bestowed upon me the honorary title of Nigeria man. <laughs> and he was, we had a conversation, it wasn't heated, but he, he acted like he was going to revoke my Nigeria man credentials, <laughs> causing my 13-year-old son who was in the car with me to be very distraught. He said, Dad, you have to stay a Nigeria man. Um, but talking about children, when I was a little boy, when I was seven years old, growing up in the middle of nowhere, Florida, in a swamp, closest town was 30 miles away, the first thing that happened in the world that brought to bear to me that maybe things weren't always right, maybe things weren't always good, wasn't the Vietnam War. Because I was in the South, it was correct and just, and we were the warriors. It was the Biafra War. And I remember very distinctly thinking, this just isn't right. This isn't right. This is a great people. It is a great nation. There was a country. And then later when I learned, something most people don't know, that there is a plausible argument that democracy began in Evo land. The very first written constitution on this planet was written by the Evo people. The very first democracy that involves self-governance, that worked for everybody, not just the Greek wealthy, but everybody was in Igbo land. And the very first democracy that permitted women leaders was in Igbo land. The West, Europe, we were still in the Dark Ages. And yet the Igbo had figured out a way to have a just and meaningful government and a just and meaningful society and due process and fairness. And to this day, you see a great many Igbo leaders that are women. So it is my honor to have been able to work with the Igbo community. We are contemplating preparing a, a, uh, an appeal to the United States Supreme Court related to the senseless slaughter and what we believe to be the genocide of the Igbo people to bring this full circle that uh, has been going on since 2016 overseen by the APC. It's not ironic, it's not a coincidence, that the only APC governor in Igbo land is the one the Supreme Court just forced upon them. Not ironic, not a coincidence. Nigeria has just been placed with a visa ban, as everyone knows. That's not a, the United States picking on Nigeria. That is the United States seeing Nigeria, the Nigeria that exists now. Not the historic Nigeria, not the hopes of 1960, not the hopes of Aransi, not the hopes of the three founders, not the hopes back to ni the 900s. That's what Nigeria has become. And unless it gets better, it of course is gonna get worse. It cannot get better unless the judiciary can be a bulwark against the corruption against the senseless slaughter, the genocide, the tribal hatred, the regional issues of one part of the country gets to have the oil, one part of the country gets to grow the food, the other part of the country gets to have the finance and the business, and then the rest of the country gets to have the guns and the power and tells the rest of the country what to do or else they will perish. That's just the start. And the visa ban is just a start. If you read President Trump's words, compared to them what he said about the other nations, it was as harsh or harsher than any other nation. He did not write this, or this wasn't written as though it were addressed to a strategic and historic ally. He was tougher on Nigeria in some regards than he was on the Sudan. And Sudan, who has been on the, uh, the terrorist uh, list, for a long time, rightly or wrongly, that's where Osama bin Laden lived. That's where Al-Qaeda was born and nourished and nurtured. And yet, if you look at the visa ban for people from the Sudan, it is hopeful. You can get off of this. In Nigeria, it is far more stern. So the people of Nigeria need to understand this 
and the S Supreme Court needs to understand. They have an opportunity to correct a wrong. And it is a wrong that is so blatant and so apparent that it, al it is almost the stuff of comedy. But it's gravely serious. It is very, very serious. That's really all that I think we have. We would probably like to open the floor to some questions. We have a handheld microphone if anyone would like to answer, ask any questions. Do you have any questions? Yes. Here. Um, hi there, my name's Madison. I'm here with the Washington Times. Um, first of all, thank you guys all for your comments. Um, this is very informative and very interesting. Um, I kind of wanted to go off of what you were talking, just talking about with the travel ban. Um, and I just kind of wanted to hear general comments um, from people on the panel. Are you mostly in agreement with this travel ban? Um, or, yeah, what are your overall thoughts and how will this affect uh, the U.S. Uh, being in support of Nigeria? You were talking about that that's something that we should be, we should support them in getting this uh, ruling from the Supreme Court overturned, but how will this ban affect us doing that? Uh, are you referring to the uh, rather aged travel ban relating to refugees and non-immigrants or the recent order whereby Nigeria was listed among many other countries where you could not come and acquire citizenship or a green card? Yes, I'm, a, I'm a referring to the, the recent addition uh, of Nigeria well, to the ban. I, I, th I think that the impact um, is indirect. I think the decision purportedly rested upon uh, the inability of the Nigerian government to ensure that they had a proper way to screen and ensure that those who are coming to the United States were not implicated, uh, radicalized in some way that created danger. Uh, that's kind of a different idea than the one we're addressing today, which is really an internal Nigerian matter. But overall, it does cast a further cloud, I believe, on Nigeria in seeking to attract foreign visitors or investment, uh, and it would, that cloud, I think, uh, would only be aggravated uh, if there's now no confidence that there's any judicial independence that would enable someone who are the visiting from abroad to secure justice, whether if they're simply on holiday or they're engaging in business. Uh, but it's part of a, a larger pattern, I believe, that is casting doubt on Nigeria's ability to function as a, uh, uh, an ordinary state, you know, when you combine it with Boko Haram and, unfortunately, uh, many other controversies that arose with the election of Mr. Buhari, a former military dictator. Professor Onye, same question. Oh, oh yeah, sure. <coughs> I think the, um, the, the, the Nigerian people are very happy with uh, the visa ban. And um, they would have asked for more. They would, um, they would have preferred that the justices, all the justices of the Supreme Court, be specifically placed on, on, a, on a travel ban along with their families. And the APC leadership, the, um, and their families, APC leadership meaning the chairman of uh, uh, APC, the leader of APC, they should all be placed on, uh, on a visa ban. Because it's very, very obvious to Nigerians that this was orchestrated by that political party. They found a way to uh, ensure that 2023, what you see playing out now is 2023. They just want to make sure that they have um, the other hurdles uh, knocked down before 2023. And Imo State is one of the most populous states in Nigeria, and certainly the most populous state in the southeastern part of Nigeria. And um, they see that state as a very critical state. Nigeria is divided into six zones. 
northeast, northwest, north central, southwest, which is Lagos, the Yorubas, southeast, which is a homogeneous uh, uh, section, all Igbos. And then you have the south side, where you have river state, cross river state, Bayesa, where you have the oil. In the southeast, there is no APC governor in the entire five states in the southeastern part of uh, Nigeria, which has been bothering the uh, uh, APC people. So now they have, uh, they have succeeded in taking Imo, which they see as a bridgehead for 2023. That's what this problem is all about. So if the US government um, realizes where the problem is coming from, which is not necessarily from the president, although everything that goes wrong must be attributed to the executive branch because he's the head of a state. But what you see here is an orchestration by all progressives um, Congress. Basically, they have discovered a brand new way of winning elections through using the judiciary, and specifically the Supreme Court. I say specifically the Supreme Court because the Court of Appeal ruled in favor of uh, Imo State. The tribunal also ruled in favor of Imo State. But I think who they have taken is the Supreme Court, because that's ultimately you know, the last uh, court. And they, they figured no matter what happens down the trial level, is the Supreme Court that would give their final ruling. So if the United States government places some of these visa bans on precisely the individuals or the groups or the, the organizations, um, i.e. the APC, then it will have more effect than just making it a general um, thing. So that's, that's what I know Nigerians um, would, would, no, would prefer. So Dr. Uh, oh. Yes. Are you suggesting that this is a conspiratorial issue? Is this conspiracy on a global or even a national scale by the Supreme Court judges who made this decision is it conspiracy? I, I don't know whether I can uh, classify it as a conspiracy. Um, but what, what I do know is that the facts are, are clear that um, the Supreme Court was corrupted. The justices, uh, beginning from the removal of the Chief Justice of Nigeria, Nigerians began to see the pendulum swinging towards one end. But they weren't quite sure what was going to happen. When he was removed, they were expecting that the Nigerian Judicial Council, NJC, would follow the process and put in someone who was qualified to be there. But they brought in Tanko Mohammed. So it became a, a bit obvious to Nigerians where this thing was going. And then after that, they rearranged the justices. Nigeria has 13 Supreme Court justices, not the way we have it here in the United States, where you have nine justices. They have 13 justices. And from that 13, they can select seven to hear a particular case. And that's where the, the, the chief justice derives a lot of what I call political you know, power. Because now he can choose the justices that he knows are going to listen to him. So in the case of Atiku versus uh, Buhari, he, instead of following the number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and cut it off, he took number one, went down, took number eight, took 10, just selected the people he felt would listen to him. And so that's when it became obvious that the judiciary was completely gone. But when the Imo State judgment came out, 
If it had come out the way Atiku's case came out, which was the server, the uh, card reader didn't work, and all of that, very technical, Nigerians would have still maybe uh, still been taken for a ride uh, again. But in this case, whether it's by divine or some, for some reason, they did 2 plus 2 equals 5. And everybody said, wait a minute. 2 plus 2 has never been 5, you know. Uh, well, the Supreme Court said, well, 2 plus 2 is 5. We're the final. So whatever we say is final, you know. And so um, it, it's very obvious that this Supreme Court does not have uh, the guts to tell the APC leadership, uh, we're sorry, we can't do this. They don't have that guts. So if they don't have that guts, it means that um, the, the, the system is completely you know, gone because governments are run by institutions, you know, uh, ministries, departments, and agencies. That's how governments are run. When you destroy those agencies, those departments, those institutions, you know, the table crumbles. If you take the four legs of a table, the table, you know, crumbles. So Nigeria has been standing on one leg, the judiciary. is the last, the common man's hope. But right now, that leg has just been chopped off. So that's the concern. You know, if the United States will step in and increase the visa ban, and as um, Mr. Bruce Fine has said, um, I think the Magnitsky... And human rights accountability. Yes, and anything they can do, you know, um, because see, the, the, the Nigerians are coming here to ask for help. The Nigerians here who are Americans are the ones asking for help, you know, because um, if you don't ask for help from your neighbor, he might not know what is happening in internally in, in, in your house. So Nigerians are saying, wait a minute, there's no way we can counter this. We cannot anymore. Because the judiciary that we used to rely on is gone. You know? And it's very easy for the Nigerian government to quickly say, we're a sovereign state. You can't tell us what to do. That's a, a major excuse that they would very soon have. And so America is not telling them what to do. America is basically saying, wait a minute, your constitution says you do it this way, you do it that way. Just follow your constitution. We're not telling you to follow American constitution. We're not telling you to take American standard or international standard. Take your standard. They have failed woefully even going by their own uh, standard. So if there's anything that um, the United States can do, and I think the easiest thing they can do is the visa ban. They've already started it. You know, The visa ban was not placed because of the Imo, Imo judgment which means there are other issues that have caught uh, the, the international community's interest. And now we are bringing this up, this, that this is the final straw that would break down Nigeria. And as Br the Bruce has said, if that happens, the, the effect in Nigeria and in the sub-region would definitely spill over to the United States. I mean, there's no doubt about that. And so it would be nice for them to nip it in the bud now and uh, uh, save uh, stitching time, uh, save snide. So that's the way I, I see it. Thank you so much. Um, okay, yeah, let's. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, a statement has already been made that the visa ban is not as a result of the Supreme Court decision. But the visa ban is a demonstration of what United States is foreseeing happening in Nigeria. I have read that visa ban front and back. And we are thinking of how do we fashion our either acceptance of the visa ban or opposition of the visa ban. And we found out that visa ban is a reaction to the policy we perceive the government is carrying out, which is what? Open border that Nigeria has with some countries that are already under sanction by United States. In other words, those citizens from 
some countries that have been banned by the United States have free ride into Nigeria to obtain visa and travel. So I think the United States is reacting to that, re to the fact that if we place all these restrictions on you, you will be able to get a message that there are people that are coming through your borders that we don't want. That is number one. Number two that is really happening, United States is trying to somehow protect the eastern part of Nigeria or the eastern or southeastern part of the southern part of Nigeria. The reason is that these cross-border practices happen mainly in the north. The north has no boundary with some of these countries, Mali, uh, or, uh, Ethiopia, yeah, I mean, or Nigerians and so many of those countries. Those borders are porous. Meanwhile, the borders in the south are strengthened. That's where you have Nigerian soldiers with guns and ammunition and everything stationed. So that area is secure, but it is the northern borders that is not secure. In other words, that is where most of this crossover, during elections, they stream into Nigeria to vote. And after that, they go. They stream into Nigeria to commit crimes. And then after that, they go. However, where we really feel aggrieved from the southern part is that it is people from the south that come to United States, that need United States visa, that bring their parents, that bring their brothers and sisters. Those in the north end up in the northern part of Africa or Britain, Saudi Europe, Saudi Arabia. They really don't come here. When you look at the population, it's a population from the south. In other words, the visa ban affects me, even though it's meant to protect me. So that is why we are thinking to support the, the opinion here that be visa ban, we shall be ap appealing to the United States government to be specific, to point it to say, if you are doing something like this, you will be affected, and not to do it as a blanket for the country. That's where we think the visa ban is so broad that should be defined. We need that to be defined. And we support it to the extent that it will send a message to the government that, listen, you have to show up your border. You have to make sure that your airport screening is up to snuff. You don't have to be a transit for anything, drugs, terrorism, or anything. We don't want that to happen. And because the government is not cognizant of what it's doing with this no visa requirement, that is creating trouble for the country. So in other words, as I'm, as I'm saying, we have... We, we are trying to juggle the, the answers and know where our opposition will come from. Thank you. I, I would just add, not to beat a dead horse, but um, as a non-Nigerian, I'm reluctant to answer this question, but I think you can see from the people speaking, um, the Ni Nigerian diaspora is perhaps like any other in the world, perhaps like any other in the history of the world. The most doctors in North America the country where most doctors in North America come from outside of North America is Nigeria. It is a well-educated, learned, hardworking, contributing, contributing diaspora movement. As Professor Stanley said, they come from the South mostly, and most of the problems are in the North. But I think, if I can guess, as someone as an observer or a commentator on Nigeria, the visa ban is a very difficult issue. It is good for most Nigerians, that finally someone recognizes something's wrong, something's very badly wrong, and it needs to be fixed. But it hurts them. The reality of it is, and I just want to expand on Dr. Stanley's, what it's showing, I think, a lot of people have a presumption that at worst, the worst part of Nigeria, that they know about Nigeria. There are a lot of things going on that most people don't know about. One of the things that looks like it's starting to happen is these new Supreme Court justices may be looking to impose Sharia law because they're from the North. That's very problematic. You can only guess what's going to happen after that, and it may happen anyway. But the, but the visa ban, what it shows and tells is that in Nigeria, there are no documentary, uh, there's, there's no structure or integrity. There are, are no identification methods, which is extraordinary for, for an advanced society. They don't have 
a way of telling who you are, who you are, where did you go, have you been convicted of a crime, are you on, on any sort of a wanted or watch list. And they do that, they, mostly the North, they do that on purpose because it suits their needs. But it doesn't suit the needs of the South and the Southwest and the South-South or the Middle Belt. They're the ones that are suffering. So it, 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 it's, a, it, it's, it's a, a tough issue, it's, it's a, a balance. It's good that the United States government is recognizing. It's something that Mr. Fine and I have tried to get them to recognize the bad things that have been going on. But it's bad for Nigeria. The hope is, is that it will be seen for what it is, which is a clear message of you better join the League of Nations. You better join the rest of the world in figuring out what you need to do to be a meaningful participant. The sad part is, is it's happening not to a backwards, middle of nowhere country. President Trump has his term for them that I won't repeat. It's happening to the giant of Africa, the heart of Africa. That if we lose the heart of Africa and the giant of Africa, we will lose all of Africa. It will just be turned over. If there is an eruption of all of the bad things that could possibly happen in Nigeria, the entire continent will be lost. And that's the serious nature of, of, of what's going on here. And the sadness that I can only imagine, I told a story about being a seven-year-old boy. These people that are here, they live it. It's their life. It's who they are. And they had to leave Nigeria to find their way and to make use of their talents that everyone here wishes they could go back to Nigeria and use. And the world would be better for that. So that's, that's the very long answer to the very good question. And we apologize. Any, any other questions? OK. As to what has been already said, um, the question is, you know, what do we think about, since Nigerians here, what do we think about the visa ban? And I think uh, t to a large extent, uh, that has been responded to by Dr. Stanley Onye. Um, and also uh, uh, Dr. Lloyd Oku, which is that uh, in general, Nigerians uh, like it, they have their reservations about it, obviously, but uh, it's definitely for them better than not. And one thing that is also very unique about it is that since that visa, visa ban, every condemnation of how it happened has been heaped, <coughs> excuse me, has been heaped on the president, Buhari. Buhari, the people are holding him accountable for whatever you know, uh, precipitated the uh, visa ban. Now, I agree that uh, as a first step, that is a good thing. Uh, what we now need to do is to hone it and sharpen it and target it uh, to those uh, who are the uh, perpetrators uh, of uh, trampling uh, on uh, people's uh, human, uh, um, human rights. The APC has been mentioned here, the leadership of APC. I think uh, those people should you know, definitely uh, be uh, you know, put uh, on the books for this. The Supreme Court justices who uh, took uh, this uh, bizarre fraudulent uh, ruling uh, should uh, be targeted as well, in fact, an attorney who uh, went to school to, uh, with uh, a couple of the justices after they said he, he had a conversation with them to see you know, what happened. And they told him that uh, we were operating under instructions. This were from uh, the, you know, the Supreme Court uh, justices. So the fact that the whole thing about the case is so bizarre is not an accident. They had to rush this thing to get the, the desired uh, uh, result. So um, going forward, like we said, I think uh, we are happy with uh, the visa ban, but we would like for it uh, eventually to be narrowed and targeted to those who are the perp perpetrators. Thank you so much. I wish I didn't need a microphone. I have a loud voice anyhow. <coughs> I'm hearing you. Uh, I, I, could I just Dr. interject Fine? before your, your question? And oh. that is that to encourage, I think, the, uh, the Nigerian Supreme Court, they might remember uh, that it wasn't all that long ago when the Pakistani Supreme Court, uh, then confronting a dictator, Pervez Musharraf, had uh, suspended all the laws. 
and he was uh, ruling by military decree. And the Supreme Court of Pakistan declared that Mr. Musharraf had committed treason. Uh, he was ousted from his position. Uh, I think he's now in prison or in some kind of uh, uh, can exile receiving treatment. Uh, but the Supreme Court confronted a very powerful dictator and prevailed. And that ought to, I think, embolden the Nigerian justice to think that it's not clear that if they stood up to Mr. Buhari, that the Nigerian people wouldn't rally to their support like they did in Pakistan, and he would be the loser. Anyway, I just wanted to make that observation that this has happened before a confrontation between the judicial branch and the executive dictatorship, and the judiciary won. Um, just to, uh, um, I'm not to find the barrister fine. Because you are an attorney, do you see a link between the Supreme Court shuffling for the decision that was made and terrorism? Since any other term may not apply, would terrorism be linked to this, to this decision that was made by the Supreme Court, especially since it was shuffled? Uh, I don't know whether it's the shuttling. That you're referencing the abandonment of the seniority system to choose the justices that would sit? Even with the ban. Yeah. Um, I think it suggests that there was some level of coercion that was employed. Now, whether or not the coercion was large sacks of cash or a threat of violence, uh, I don't know. Uh, cash, the term would be bribery. Um, if you're threatening uh, to uh, disappear a justice, kill or otherwise, then that could be something akin to what happened to Mr. Khashoggi uh, mm -hmm. at the behest of MBS. But I don't think you could know which avenue of coercion was used uh, just on the basis of both circumstantial evidence and what we know. I would add that the only tie I think that you could see, well not the only, but the tie that I see is, it shows a misdirection. It shows a lack of attention to what should be done, a misdirection of the resources and the use of the government in Nigeria away from what you would expect it to do toward what can only be seen as a consolidation of power. I would, I would correct Dr. Lloyd here where he said that APC has found a new way to win elections. They're not winning elections, they're winning power. They didn't win the elections. They lost the election. The elections have become superfluous. It's a seizure of power. So to utilize the army to carry these apparently, obviously, fraudulent voting results when there's no one fighting Boko Haram, and Boko Haram and the terrorists have been spotted in the forests around Lagos and Oyo throughout the Middle Belt, that's a misdirection of the resources and, and ultimately the fundamental purpose of why the government is there, to keep people safe and safe in their home. The three things that I read you about what the judiciary should do, that's generally you could apply them to most of the government. But I, but I would say that that link there, yes, it's a way to accumulate power. That seems to be the central focus of the APC-led government, whether it's Tanubu or Bihari, the Cabal, or whoever else. They are intent upon gathering power. They're not intent upon taking care of the people, taking care of the country. They've even turned their back on the economy of the country. Right now in the Delta region, the world still thinks of it as it thought of it in the late 80s and early 90s, that it's a dangerous place. There's the vandals. They're blowing things up. They're killing people. Nobody should invest their money there, and that couldn't be further from the truth. That's not true. There should be a concerted effort by the governors to get together and convince the world to come here and invest. I mean, for God's sake, it's, it, it's a port on the Atlantic Ocean. 
top 10 in oil production. And yet people keep their money away from there as though you were being asked to invest in a coconut farm in Montana. It's just absolutely extraordinary. And the government doesn't care because they want power. That's all they want. So it's, I, I think it is only another symptom of a self-serving government, a government that has turned inward. The best job in Nigeria is, is to be in the state assembly or to be in government. It's a good job. You make a lot of money. And there are no expectations. Well, you do. That's right. That's right. Like they don't win elections; they they they, they grab power. They they are not making their money. They're stealing. But but that's an e those are easy things to say. But they're all true. So yes, that that connection. I can see that connection. The shuffling. It's just another symptom of what are these guys doing here? What are we doing here? Why are they doing this? And the answer is they just want power. But I think you mentioned the, the families as well. Uh, and it's oftentimes the, the wives and the kids come here even if the, the justices do not. And it signals as well. Obviously, people have a, a, a pride in their reputation. Uh, it's clearly a stigma to be listed as a, someone who violates internationally recognized fundamental human rights. Uh, and I don't think anybody relishes that. I was just thinking that the, the ban was against OIC countries, of which Nigeria is one. Yeah. And if that's the case, that's the reference to terrorism. So I'm, I'm still can't get the connection between the court action, the ban, and OIC. It, it, something is missing there. I mean, what's the ban for, <coughs> for Nigeria? Why? Well, the, the ban that was explained by the State Department uh, was that there was an inability to screen those who were coming to the United States for radicalism or terrorism uh, to give the United States a confidence level that we would not be importing uh, criminals or violence. Now, that was the stated reason. Uh, now, that doesn't have any immediate connection to the corruption of the uh, Supreme Court. Um, so we're, that, we're on that now. Yeah, that we were asking to go beyond that. Remember, the visa ban does not apply to just visitors. No. Uh, it applies to those who want to come and become green card holders or U.S. citizens. Uh, we're the, the visa ban that we're speaking about to be imposed on the justices or on the APC would mean you can't even visit the United States for any reason whatsoever. And that would likely arise from the global magnetic field. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, the, the, again, along the lines of your question, uh, one cannot also put uh, it away from uh, reality that uh, the shuffling of the Supreme Court that uh, brought a Sharia uh, mm -hmm. on to the Chief uh, Justice it is also a concern because uh, this is not somebody who ordinarily Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm saying that I can't, you know, put that uh, to f that thinking about how unsafe that we can with this kind of uh, Supreme Court justice uh, that we have. That the shuffling that was made kind of uh, took away or overlooked hundreds and thousands of very qualified, you know, attorneys in Nigeria. The only person they could find to become the chief justice is a Sharia a lawyer that basically doesn't have a, you know the the broad based experience that one would expect from a Nigerian Supreme Court. Given the, the chief justice, would that change it? Well, he I don't know whether it will change it or not, 
but he definitely sent a signal. For anybody, that would be a wrong signal, especially for communities where we have our fillers up for Sharia-related uh, conversions uh, that most Christian societies now in Nigeria and abroad are very sensitive to. Let me, let me just say one thing. One of the things that we have been amplifying in terms of the visa ban is that the visa ban, even though it's targeted at Nigeria, there in the country, it affects us here very much. It affects us here. As a matter of fact, it denies us some of the rights that we have here. If you are uh, an American citizen, you can petition to bring your mother, your brothers and sisters down here. That This visa ban nullifies that. Some people that have wives, they are here, they are green card holders, they are citizens, they cannot bring their wives from Nigeria. In other words, that has consequence for us here. People that have adopted children, they cannot bring them over here. In other words, when you, you look at it, we are directly impacted here, even though we might support the intended consequence. So that's why if you can, if what we have been saying here is that we are going to appeal to the State Department, to the United States government, to somehow modify that, knowing fully well that the law-abiding citizens here are seriously being impacted. I think um, the U.S. citizens, Nigerian Americans, should call their Congress uh, men, um, on call, call to action and let them understand that they should place the ban on the Supreme Court justices and the leadership of APC, because that's where the problem is coming from. And in responding to your question, if you remove the Chief Justice, would there be a difference? The answer is no, because that's not where the problem really is. It doesn't originate there. They're merely a tool to achieve, um, it's a merely a tool that APC is using to uh, achieve this you know, political uh, uh, gains. You know, any Supreme Court justice that you place there, if it's, if it's not strong, will be threatened. If you do not do this, we will remove you. Not only will we remove you, we are going to find something uh, criminal and, for, and then prosecute you for, you know, for that. So here is the kind of judgment we want you to deliver on these cases. They, especially when you removed um, the, the chief justice and replaced him with another person. That's a big favor. Yes, you replace him with that person, and that person is obviously going to take directives, instructions you know, from you. So, but the problem is not that the, the Supreme Court justices woke up one morning and said, listen, this Imo, Imo State case, we're going to convert 2 plus 2 to be 5. They didn't do that. It was the, the, the government, the, the APC people that said to them, this is how we want you to do it. And so if pressure needs to be brought to bear, it has to be on the APC leadership and also on the Supreme Court justices because they are the main, the final actors. They could have said no, but they didn't. So you're punishing them for not standing up to the oath uh, of office you know, that they took. So that, in my viewpoint, is what um, the, uh, the visa ban and other pressures, you know, is the visa ban that we're very familiar with, but if the U.S. has other uh, means of pressurizing or convincing, let's put it this way, not pressure, convincing the Nigerian government, the Nigerian judiciary to do the right thing. It will be 
you know, very nice. If it requires diplomacy, maybe talking to them behind the scene, that should also be done by the, um, the State Department to encourage them to you know, do the uh, right thing. That's, that's what we think uh, would, would uh, take care of this uh, situation. So uh, Mr. Bruce is going to just close it up? Well, I think that we'll have Mr. Fine close it up. The only thing that I would suggest is uh, to build on what Lloyd, perhaps to focus it a little bit, um, congressmen may be reluctant to discuss removing the justices in another country. But what they will not be reluctant to discuss, everyone that sees this tape, everyone that visits this website, or however this turns out, or goes to CAFTAN, or reads the Washington Times report, if everyone called their congressman and said something has to be done, this is the, the continuation of the deterioration of Nigeria, the collapse of democracy in Nigeria, the collapse of Nigeria, you must do something. And if they ask you what, say, write a letter demanding or directing that this judgment needs to be reversed. That's where we are right now. The further bigger issues, perhaps sometime later, not to be forgotten, but for right now, the collapse of Nigeria, the collapse of Nigerian democracy. Call your congressman. They will do that. Senator Menendez wrote the letters for Sawari. It wasn't because he had an extraordinary interest in Nigeria. It was because his constituents called him. There are many friends to Nigeria in Congress. Representative Chris Smith from New Jersey. Representative Karen Bass from California. They are the people that will get this done. And they will send a letter to President Buhari, perhaps even to the, to the Supreme Court, directing them or suggesting or asking that they reconsider this decision and set it aside as a travesty of justice and a collapse of the democracy in Nigeria. So if we don't have any more questions, I'm going to ask Mr. Fine to go ahead and summarize. And th again, for me and for everyone here, being so presumptuous as to speak for them, thank you for coming. Thank you very, 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 very much. But just to, to close, uh, uh, justice is won by persistence. Uh, there's so many things in life that are imponderable. So never get discouraged. Uh, never give up. Uh, if it doesn't uh, happen immediately that the court reverses its decision, uh, you continue to persist. Uh, that is one lesson that you, you've got to learn. Uh, and with, in our own uh, situation here in the United States, the civil rights movement after a dormancy for about 100 years suddenly uh, took traction. Uh, the second thing is um, the United States is, through simple um, uh, encouragement and force of opinion, uh, oftentimes decisive uh, abroad. I think we were instrumental in ending apartheid in South Africa uh, and in ending one rule government with Britain in uh, what's now called Zimbabwe. At one time it was Rhodesia. I think Ferdinand Marcos exited uh, uh, the Philippines and Manuel Noriega, Panama. So we shouldn't underestimate the importance of the United States and uh, the voice that it can have. Uh, in this effort uh, to cure what is clearly, I don't even want to use the word injustice. It was just raw power. The, the, the decision is so bad, it was just as though someone just made up the result without even having votes and said, we're declaring this person a winner uh, because the transparency of the, the fraud. Uh, and I think that this is also, I think, um, uh, an encouragement throughout Nigeria. Uh, this case is e exemplary, but the strength of the judicial branch is key to having rule of law and having stability. Without access to justice, uh, where you can redress grievances and all peaceful political avenues of redress are closed, uh, the ramifications are quite terrifying. Uh, and unfortunately, that's a risk that right now uh, hangs like a sort of Damocles over Nigeria. And we're here to try to prevent that from happening. Thank you.
Class, class dismissed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you.